This past week, we witnessed an escalation between Israel and Iran that's never been seen before. A direct attack on Israel from Iran. So what happens next? Will this continue to escalate? Or is this just the beginning of a larger conflict? Now, I did ask our community in a recent poll if they thought this conflict between Iran and Israel was going to spiral out of control. And a whopping 76% of you thought that this was just the beginning of a much wider conflict. There's a lot to unpack and consider, especially for this community, as we want to ensure that we're ready for whatever may come next. So, of course, the question becomes, well, how do you prepare for the possibility that this may indeed escalate? I'm going to answer that for you later in the video, and we're also going to do another giveaway, so you're definitely going to want to stick around for that. Now, before we dive into this news segment, though, it's essential to clarify the purpose of why we do these news videos. They are designed to provide you with relevant information to help inform your preparedness decisions. A lot of us, myself included, I want to be aware of potential problems to ensure that I can prepare myself and my family to weather any storms on the horizon. I want to get a full picture of what's happening. And look, if you're feeling overwhelmed, our library of how-to videos offers detailed information and solutions for uncertain times. And while we can't really control global challenges, fortifying our environments enhances our resilience. And with that said, let's jump into the news that you need to know this week. A quick summary. As I mentioned earlier, this conflict has been going on for quite some time now, and it would take volumes and volumes to detail it all. Side note, there's no really quick solution that will realistically be implemented either. It would definitely take more time than this video will allow to try and explain the history of how we got to where we are today. So I'm gonna focus on a quick summary of just April. Now, on the first of this month, Israel allegedly conducted a missile strike on the Iranian consular office in Damascus, Syria. Now, I say allegedly only because Israel has not officially claimed responsibility, but I don't think anyone is less than 99% certain that it was Israel behind the attack that killed seven members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC, including two generals in charge of leading operations in Syria and Lebanon, along with six other people. Now, this is not the first Israeli attack on high-ranking IRGC officials. It's just the latest. And Iran's retaliation sparked global concern with leaders urging de-escalation. Now, the long-standing proxy war between Iran and Israel escalated when Hamas, backed by Iran, directly attacked Israel last October, resulting in a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Now, Iran's proxy armies, including Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis, have been targeting Israel and Western forces in the Red Sea. And on April 1st, Israel allegedly struck a meeting in Damascus, and in response, Iran launched a massive aerial assault on Israel on April 13th, with 99% of the projectiles intercepted, marking a historic confrontation. Now, Iran launched 170 suicide drones, 120 ballistic missiles, and 30 cruise missiles at Israel, a massive 85 tons of explosive. And it was the first time the Islamic Republic, long hostile to the Israeli state, directly attacked Israel after decades of proxy conflict. And I think that's why this is such a unique situation. Now, Jordan shot down some less to protect Israel and more to maintain the sovereignty of its airspace. And Saudi Arabia shot down some as well in Yemen for the same reason. Now, the U.S. shot down 80 drones and three ballistic missiles. And British and French partners, they shot down even more. And Israel air defenses compromising what it calls the Iron Dome shot down many as well. In all, 99% of the aerial projectiles were neutralized. So on one hand, it was one of the most expensive aerial bombardments in world history. And on the other hand, it was one of the most extensive aerial bombardments in world history to be almost neutralized. And even though the overt act by Iran was only 1% effective, they officially declared the retaliation for the Damascus attack complete. Now, Israel's war cabinet, which meets together every 48 hours, they emerged from their Sunday meeting vowing a retaliatory response for the aerial bombardment. And they did not say what form that retaliation would take, but the U.S. signaled it wanted no part of it. It would not support Israel in its further retaliation, risking an out-of-control escalation. And at this moment, we wait to understand what Israel's response will be, but I only see it going one of two ways because there isn't enough collective world support for a further escalation. What will happen next? 
Either Israel will implement a covert operation against Iranian assets in Iran, either people or military-related resources like missile production facilities, or they will surgically strike through an air attack. Now, Israel has conducted surgically precise air strikes in hostile nearby countries before. This is not new. Operation Opera occurred all the way back in the early 80s when Israeli fighter jets attacked, ironically, with Iran's support, the Ozarak reactor in Iraq. Now, in 2007, Israeli fighter jets attacked a nuclear reactor under construction in Syria. So, some type of surgical strike in Iran is not out of the question. It would allow them to show how effective they can be and how far reaching they can be. And it's less likely to create a broader conflict because it's not the same as randomly shooting hundreds of missiles and drones into a civilian population center. Now, look, <clears throat> not to sound too sterile and cold about this, but I think most of the world is probably going to be okay with a proxy war, but doesn't have the stomach for a land war in the region. Selling arms and supporting allies from afar is much more appealing than actually engaging your country's military forces. And I think that's why one of these more low-key options is probably going to be the more likely Israeli response. Now, there are some who will speculate that Netanyahu and forces in Israel, they want to drag the U.S. and the West into a direct confrontation with Iran. And there are some voices that say that the U.S. is seeking a once and for all conflict with Iran. And there's no denying that these voices are in these discussions. And I feel that there's a general sense that a broader conflict wouldn't really benefit any country. And that's one of the reasons the world was so shocked at the direct Iranian retaliatory response. Now, one thing is for certain, and that is that Israel will retaliate in one form or another. So what do you think is going to happen next? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. The U.S. and world response. This week, you're going to hear a whole lot about this, especially since four separate spending bills are coming to a vote in Congress this Friday when we're releasing this video. Now, these bills primarily reflect the $95.3 billion aid package that the Senate passed in February, which allocated $60 billion for Ukraine, $14 billion for Israel, $9 billion for humanitarian assistance to Gaza, and $5 billion for Indo-Pacific allies trying to counter China. Side note, it still blows my mind that we're sending $9 billion in aid to Gaza while providing Israel with the funding to attack Gaza. Anyway, Opinions on this spending for Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, and the Indo-Pacific defenses are all over the aisles and all over the map. There's not really consensus in a party or even a majority for or against it. And representatives know that Ukraine is beginning to suffer defeats to Russia because of delays in funding and that not funding will hand Putin a victory in the long run. If Putin does push past Ukraine into nations part of NATO, that would trigger the United States to get directly involved. Representatives know something has to be done to support our allies in the Indo-Pacific. And they know that there's a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And Israel is our staunchest ally in the Middle East. And some of these funding packages have been tied to other measures like border security and budget cuts. And there's so much at work and behind the scenes here that I can't really say what will happen with these four bills. But like you, I'll be waiting to assess all of this on Saturday. I think we have to understand how this Israel-Iran conflict is going to shape geopolitical moves going forward, and most importantly, what it's going to mean to you. The United States would like to focus its energy on what's happening in Ukraine, but it also wouldn't mind if the Iranian influence were significantly reduced or eliminated. While they don't want a wider regional war in the Middle East, but they're still okay with degrading Iranian forces through their proxy armies. Russia is thrilled at a distraction a Middle East conflict provides as it wages war against Ukraine. And you can see the division it sows in the fact that there are four separate bills being debated in Congress concerning funding and supporting our overseas partners, but only one of them is Ukraine support. Russia, however, doesn't want to see a broader direct conflict between Iran and Israel because they need missiles and drones and similar equipment from Iran for use in Ukraine. Russia needs drones and missiles, and they're buying a lot of them from Iran. Iran has an estimated 3,000 ballistic missiles, for example, even though they lack the capability of firing them all at once. If they are engaged in an active back-and-forth volley with Israel, they're not going to sell missiles or parts to Russia. And it's unknown how many Iranian unmanned drones there are, but Russia ordered 1,700 of them just last October. 
Now, more significant, more direct conflict would certainly hold up their deliveries. And the final superpower that has to be addressed here is probably China. They are for anything that further assaults Western hegemony. And in the past, we assumed they wouldn't do anything that would impact their economy, but we're seeing them transition away from that model. And though several sanctions against Iran exist, roughly 90% of Iran's crude oil exports, they went to China. And it works because a shadowy dark transport fleet has been cobbled together. Transponders are being shut off, tankers are loaded in Iranian ports, and then they sell to China. And there's nothing sketchy about that, right? China is really fine with proxy wars for purely economic reasons, but does not want a direct conflict that risks oil exports. Giveaway. This week, we're going to give away a hand crank emergency radio, weather alert, and solar radio. To participate in the giveaway, all you have to do is simply comment on the video, give it a thumbs up, and then complete the giveaway form linked in the description section below. Now, this information is only going to be accessible to our team. And using a random selection tool, we're going to choose a winner from the comments and reach out via the email you provided on the submitted form. So congratulations to our last giveaway winner, Ryan Edwards. We're going to reach out to you directly via email to get that windproof camp stove sent to you. Congrats. How this impacts you. Okay, so let's get down to brass tacks. While I recognize a chance that Israel could do something massive to draw the West into a direct confrontation with Iran, <clears throat> I think the chances are low. They're going to retaliate, though, in some way, and you can bet secret negotiations are probably happening right now between Israel and all the countries I mentioned to really mitigate and attempt to contain the response. And the most direct impact on you is going to be gas prices. And even though Iranian oil is not necessarily flowing to refineries in the United States, the threat of it not illegally flowing to China will cause a bump in price. And this is also going to raise transportation and manufacturing costs. That's going to result in jumps in the prices of most things that you buy. Many believe the sweet spot of oil should be about $100 a barrel, and many countries need it there to support their war efforts. Many believe that higher prices are going to encourage people to vote in specific ways and that stalling will cause enough economic pain to sway elections. And that's the economic aspect of how it will impact you. But you should also be aware of the increased probability of terrorist attacks. Now, terrorists are really just nothing more than state-sponsored proxy forces, if you want to be honest. When a country can't engage directly with another one, you'll see these small terror actors rising up and then taking the blame. So raise the threat level there. I think we're going to continue to see attacks on infrastructure through cyber attacks. And Iran's not a big cyber attack player per se, but Russia and China, they are. And it's an easy way for those countries to show support for Iran without coming out and directly supporting them. It also ingratiates them to Iran to encourage a continued flow of missiles or oil or whatever else is needed. So if I were prepping for these things, I would start by ensuring I had three weeks to three months of food and water on hand in case one or more of these infrastructure attacks were successful. And while I don't expect Iranian missiles to fly over Florida or California, the possibility of an infrastructure or terror attack is more significant right now and through the rest of this year. And the way to protect yourself and those you love is to insulate yourself from the effects of these attacks. Let me finish this segment <clears throat> by saying a few things here. Uh, first of all, my apologies. Every week I try to get out a how-to video. I did not get out one this week. I always love just some kind of simple how-to to really educate and teach uh, you on any basic preparedness skill set. Uh, the last two weeks, I've been working on my annual solar generator review, where I compare the different models on the market to give you all the information you need if you're in the market for buying one of these. Um, I do this video each year, and the videos typically do really well. In excess, I think last year was 1.2 million. The other one was 2.2 million because I just give you the information to help you make the right decision for your basic needs. And I'm trying to get that video out, hopefully no later than this weekend, early next week. Um, on a personal note, uh, weight loss, it's something I've been talking about a lot on the channel. I've been kind of giving updates here and there at the beginning of the year, I did a whole playlist on physical fitness and, uh, you know, you can go check that out. I'll post a link below. We spent a lot of time and money to put those together. Uh, didn't get a lot of views, but I, I'm only bringing that up because I want you to really take this serious. Uh, and let me just share my own personal story really quick. I'll do a much in more in-depth breakout video here soon. But uh, on January 15th of this year, 
I decided to get really serious about getting my body in shape. And I'm about to share a photo with you here in just a second. It's really awkward for me to do this. One of my biggest fears is I have this recurring dream where I'm somehow at a public event without my shirt on. I always freak out. So this is you know kind of difficult putting this out there, but I'm just showing you this to show what can be done. I'm down over 21 pounds since I started three months ago. I was 178 when I started on January 15th. Last Saturday when I weighed, I was 177. And let me just show the photo. I'll put it here on the screen. Um, on the left is the photo of me on January 15th. And again, I was at 178. And the picture on the right is uh, just last Saturday. I was at 157 pounds. And one of the things I've always hated hearing is the phrase, if I can do it, anyone can do it. And I used to get so annoyed when I heard that because I was like, well, I can't, you know, I've tried. And it's just, I've, I've done so many weightlifting and exercise. I've done marathons and the way always stuck. But now I understand what that phrase means because I thought it was impossible. I'm 48 years old and I just kind of gave up. But I'm here and I'm an example of what can be done. And if there was one word that sums up my uh, journey, what I've learned over the last three months, it's consistency. I've done the same darn thing day in and day out. I've eaten uh, on a consistent, regular schedule, seven days a week. Every now and then, you know, on a Saturday night, I'll have a cheat meal, but I stick with the routine. I work out five days a week. I've not missed a single workout since I started and it's paid off. And so my goal is to drop another five pounds of body fat or so. And once I hit the goal, I'll uh, do a video on it, uh, you know, just sharing that whole journey. Why am I doing this? Why am I sharing this information? Because I just want you, the community, to take your health serious. Uh, the stats, you've, if you haven't studied the impact of you know, going over a certain body percentage of fat, you increase your risk of diabetes, cancer, heart issues. It's, and again, the more I studied it, the more I realized you know, I'm just not taking it as serious as I should. So it's easier to talk a big game and to say, hey, we should get in shape and sit here and tell you this, but it's another thing to demonstrate it. And so again, I put that out there just to encourage you that, yeah, it can be done. And let me end, <clears throat> let me end this video on some encouragement. Um, again, when we do these new segments, it's heavy. There's a lot to consider and it can be overwhelming. But again, I, I realize we live in uncertain times and as preppers, this is why we do what we do. I have been part of this community. I started my channel about eight years ago. I love this community. I love the fact that we're proactive, that we're thinking ahead. And again, I've always tried to position this channel as giving you practical information so you can take actionable, you know, you can take steps. And I say all that because I, you know, I'll say this every time I talk about this, you have to understand you are not a victim. It's really difficult for me to be around people that always have an excuse as to why they can't do something or, uh, you know, I've heard it all, but when I decided personally to take my personal preparedness journey serious and I took the reins of it, it's given me a sense of peace and calm that if we have any type of major event, whether that's where I live, we're always you know, uh, being told about earthquakes or fire or man-made, whatever it is, I can take care of my family. And while I look on the horizon and see the uncertainty, I know that this lifestyle, it has caused me to step up in my health it's caused me to step up in so many ways to better my own life and my family's life. And this is, I, I view preparedness from a holistic perspective of let's think through all the aspects of our life. And even more so in these times that we live in where seemingly almost anything can happen overnight. And I don't say that to scare people, but it's, we've lived in very, uh, very peaceful times, at least since I've grown up. And we're now moving into an era where uncertainties are becoming the norm. But my encouragement, and I'll finish by saying this, is to guard your mental health. If you're feeling overwhelmed, don't sit and stew about the problems of the world. I would encourage you not to sit around and watch stuff that's only going to work you up, that gives you no actionable steps to fix it. Uh, that's why I just can't really get down with the mainstream media because it's always this elic trying to elicit an emotional response to get you stirred up or anger, uh, you know, angry about something. And I'm in a position now where I'm like, look, if this does not benefit me or help me to take action to get prepared or, you know, some actionable information to better my life, then I prefer not to listen to it. So my encouragement to you is guard what you listen to and guard your mental health. If you're finding yourself being frustrated, we've got a lot of videos on our channel in the how to playlist that will show you some things that you can get busy with. Whew. 
So <clears throat> what do you think is going to happen next in this situation in the Middle East? Will this war escalate? Do you think into a much larger ground war? Or do you think this is going to go more of a containment direction? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And I would encourage you, if you're not sure where to start, check out our videos. We've got two that I'll post here on the side of the screen. Three months is all you need as a prepper. And the other video, five steps you can take to prepare for cyber attacks, a how-to guide. And again, I'll post both of those here on the side of the screen. As always, stay safe out there.